to begin, tell us about the, the path that led you to the go-betweens. You weren't always destined for a career in music, were you? Uh, no. I, um, after I left school, I um, went to the University of Queensland and got a Bachelor of Social Work. And while I was doing that, I um, was... Um, so that was 68 to 72. It was a pretty... That was a pretty interesting time, time you know, globally, but it was a really interesting time to be living in Brisbane. Uh, and I, w while I was studying, I, I did a pra practical work in um, the Aboriginal and Islander Legal Serv Service, which had been set up by the Whitlam government at the end of 72. Mm -hmm. So I stayed on there, working in that for two years. And um, I travelled all over Queensland and um, visited all the Indigenous communities and really saw a lot of, a lot of stuff that changed me a lot. And um, I became very radicalised very quickly. And uh, in the end, I um, just was truly exhausted by that experience and uh, decided to go into the arts. I might say that simultaneously in that period, 73 and 74, that I was living um, all over Queensland and visiting Indigenous communities, I was living in a house in Brisbane with Geoffrey Rush and Billy Brown. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, so, um, and we all packed up and went to Europe in um, 75. And um, Geoffrey went to the De Cruz School of Mime in Paris, and Billy went to the Royal Shakespeare Company. And um, I hitchhiked around Europe for a couple of years and would go, go back to London and visit Geoffrey in Paris and um, stayed in the Shakespeare and Company bookstore in Paris for a long time. And uh, in London I was doing kind of acting lessons and dancing lessons and I'd taken up, played drums in 73 and 74 in that house which had a big music room, but kind of not seriously. So, you know, I'm you know, getting older and still not really... Um, <laughs> still, not, still not really into the, doing drums in the traditional way that, say, a young boy would take up drums. Yeah. Uh, in the mid-70s, I came back to Brisbane and worked as an actor, first in the popular theatre troupe and then in the Grin and Tonic theatre troupe, travelling through Queensland. And th then I started really being serious about drums. I was playing all the time and, uh, and um, playing with different groups, um, taking lessons, practicing, being threatened by neighbours. <laughs> they'd kill me if I didn't stop. And finally, um, in 79, I got my first, in my first serious punk band called Zero, which is an all-girl punk band. And I was with them for a year and then moved across to the go-betweens. The go-betweens were looking for a drummer. They were looking for a female drummer. They were dead serious. And, uh, you know, I was kind of really interest interested in... Um, Robert, he he had a, you know, he had a kind of f philosophy, you know, he kind of rejected the subculture of rebellion and he, you know, said that the subculture I identified with was too safe and, and easy, you know, that it had all the standard responses to drugs and parents and politics and that he saw another culture that was kind of an in-between culture yeah. and, uh, you know... Um, and uh, they, that was, you know, kind of the go-between thing. And I guess they were just really ambitious. And anyway, I got the job. You were immediately struck by the songs that Robert and Grant were writing. Were you an instant fan? Um, I think I was more a fan of the men at first than I, I were of the music. And, um, you know, by that I mean how they thought, what films they were interested in, what books... It seemed like, you know, I'd found some people in Brisbane who were like the generation of men and women I'd hung out with when I was living there in the early 70s, who actually had an artistic vision. You know, it's hard to find that. Mm. And um, so it was that. But let me say that I think the reason um, we were so matched musically is that we were, the three of us were so inexperienced. So, you know, they didn't have a lot of rhythms they could play on guitar and I didn't have a lot of rhythms I could play on drums uh -huh. and uh, so we grew together yeah. musically. How did you see your role as the drummer in the band in a band where, where lyrics were, were I guess such an important part of the music was it to, to remain I guess subtle? Well I, I just had to um, back the song yeah. and that's all I did. Um, I guess the, in the early albums though there was, were, there was a question of the strange timings 
um, in a number of songs, particularly the ones Grant was writing, where the songs were strangely timed, so seven fours, with Catalan Kane with a five four thrown into the um, yeah into the verse. It's actually four four five four two four, and um, uh, you know there were a number of seven fours, and I just played those times as were given to me, whereas. A more traditional drummer would have played through them and converted them back to four four, and the bat, you know, the the guitarist would have ended up playing four four in the end. But you know, I suppose I loved that kind of quirky stuff, and again, it was just supporting the song. You know, it's lucky in a way that I didn't have a lot of um, skill because um, really, it, it was just about supporting the song. <laughs> Was it a, as big a mystery to you as it was to a lot of us here that the band didn't achieve the same type of recognition back home here in Australia as it did overseas? No, it was absolutely no mystery to me, and I'm sure I, I, there, there must be I must be on record saying this, and like, but it, it was just I, I don't get how people think that we would have ever been um, popular here with the type of culture that exists in Australia. Mm -hmm. You know what people were listening to and the. 80s and I mean what the mainstream was like and particularly what commercial radio is like was like then and and is like now I mean really the the band was far too quirky far too gauche and and uh, the, the the lyrics far too intelligent for um, commercial radio ever to get a hold on and uh, if commercial radio wasn't going to get a hold on it you weren't going to be popular <laughs> and the production values too until the last album our production values I mean they weren't mainstream production values mm. so i guess it wasn't a difficult decision then to relocate to england when you did no 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 no, no, no that wasn't difficult at all we, we really belonged in that rough trade culture yeah yeah that's where we, that's we were happily we happily sat there for a couple of years until of course rough tr trade dropped us because they took on the smiths <laughs> <laughs> which album do you look back on with the most pride or look back on with as the most uh, happy recording experience um oh that's really difficult but because uh, there's i mean the 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 most un the unhappy experience were i can tell you the unhappy experiences was spring hill fair which although that was in the most fabulous studio in the entire world in the south of france it was um owned by um the french um composer called uh, his name escapes me right now unfortunately and you know it was in you know there were waterfalls and it was a vineyard and it was like superb but i had a really hard time because um the producer was insisting that i play to click tracks and then you know i wasn't very good at playing to click tracks at that stage i learned yeah. to do it later and you know then want to replace me with machines and so you know that was just a shit fight and um the last album i was really really unhappy so that those two were unhappy times for me and so the others were all incredibly happy but i guess i was really happy with um Tallulah because Amanda had just joined the band and on Tallulah you can hear all the if you listen to Jack Kerouac for instance you'll hear how the violin and the drum parts were synchronized mm -hmm. we, we worked everything out we worked every song out so that the, our parts were rhythmically um, shaped together so Amanda joining was a, a big change in dynamics yeah it was yeah. great yeah. Yeah, yeah it was great because just having another woman in the group, you know, it really was getting very tiring being the only woman. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's hard to explain why that is, uh, but it is. What about leaving England and returning back home? Was there a defining moment when you knew the time was right to do that? No, not for me. I, I would have never come home. Um, it, it was Robert and Grant who, and Amanda who wanted to come back. In fact, that's why we lost Robert Vickers, because Robert Vickers went across to New York and stayed there. He didn't want to come back. And I um, I came back, but I'd go back over and then come back here. And, and I guess that's one of the reasons that last album was unhappy for me, but I just couldn't place myself geographically. I... I was, you know, just slightly lost. Now, the split came at a time, I guess, just after you'd achieved, I guess, the closest you ever had to any mainstream recognition here. Was, was it the fact that no amount of success could have kept the band together at that point, that the split was inevitable? 
Yeah, there there was no saving us. It was just beyond repair. You know, we'd just lived and seen and been through too much together and, you know, we all held on to, you know, past grievances and knew how to use those against one another and it was just too much time had elapsed, I suppose. It was a shame, really. Yeah. Yeah. I was a bit nutty at that time too, you know, I was 38 and, and didn't, you know, was wondering how the hell I was going to have a child. I did have a child. Yeah. You know, if, 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 if we hadn't broken up, I don't know if that would have been possible because you had to, you know, I had to stop and and uh, calm down and collect myself before yeah. I could even think of conceiving. So I was able to do all that. So in hindsight, it was probably the best thing for you personally. Uh, to, to break up? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But it's not, it was hard to see that at the time. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. If you could have the whole go betweens over again, what, is there anything you'd, you'd be sure to do differently? Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd behave differently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I, you know, I, I never get that, that, that whole thing when people say regrets. What? I haven't got any regrets, you know. <laughs> my God, my life is one big regret. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Were you a fan of the, the latest version of the go-betweens? No. No? no? <laughs> Why would I be? <laughs> uh, you know, I just, uh, I mean, I, 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 I was not a fan. I, yeah. I, all I wanted to hear was, you know, I wanted to hear Amanda's parts. I wanted to hear my parts. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I've listened to the tribute album, and you know, frankly, I don't understand why they did it because they're just doing my parts and mm. and playing Amanda's parts on on uh, guitar. And um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think it it uh, validated my role in the band when I heard the new band and and um because you know it made me realize how important like, things like the drums were yeah and the, and the violin no i can't say i was a fan but you know i should be more gracious than that because <laughs> that last album you know was quite lovely and did very very well in fact better than any of our albums mm -hmm. but then after all they did have like 25 years to build to that album and um, so it's not surprising that eventually, just due to seniority, you were going to get, get going to have you know a success. Yeah, yeah. It's just a shame I wasn't playing on it. Absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of us agree with that too. <laughs> oh, that's kind. <laughs> Did you know exactly what you wanted to do with the next phase of your career after the split? No, no. no well, except to have a baby, so yeah. I hadn't thought about it at all. Um, I wasn't concerned, really. I mean, no, fr frankly, at that stage, I could only think it, I wasn't quite capable of any planning whatsoever until I had a child. And 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 I should say that um, I had the child, and and all I owned, and, and this is honestly the truth, was a <laughs> drum kit, my '64 Ludwig, which I'm looking at right now. Yeah. And um, and so I had a lot to do, to, uh, and I I had a lot to. I had to come to terms with the mainstream and and work my way into Sydney um, music industry and, you know, Sydney community music and Sydney teaching. And I set myself the task of doing it and um, I think. Tell us about uh, Cleopatra Wong. What, what was the in initial inspiration for that? And, and how determined were you to distinguish it from, from the music that uh, you'd been involved with before? Well, the difference was that we imagined I were going to write because, uh, of course, we, that was denied us in the go-betweens, which was not a problem for me. That was what was understood when you joined the go-betweens that Robin Grant were the writers. And um, my, I was just not a great writer, and Amanda blossomed as a writer, so that was wonderful for her. And we worked out a deal to share songwriting, so I didn't feel aggrieved. Um, and um, it was a fantastic experience that we've toured Asia. Uh, we put out two EPs, which are, I think are absolutely marvellous. We made wonderful videos. But I had my child in the middle of that, and she had her child. And when we were on the road, and she was eight months pregnant, and I had left my nine-month-old Lucinda with her dad in uh, Sydney, and we were both, like, going nuts 
you know, in 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 Seoul and 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 <laughs> <laughs> Hong Kong. God, when women tell me that they. You know, that, oh yes, well, I can keep on chewing and having a child. I honestly don't know what they're talking about. You know, we had a, then we had, then we had a, the two children. We're taking the two children to, um, I was not, I didn't live with the dad, uh, my, my daughter's father. Uh, you know, we're taking the children on tour. I can't even begin to tell you what a nightmare it was just getting to Melbourne with two babies. <laughs> Um, and in the end, we just gave it away. And, of course, Amanda went into music and film and has been really successful with that. But, yeah, um, that was it. We wanted mm. to do it, but I guess um, the biological imperative it took just, over in the end. It wasn't practical, yeah. Mm. Let's talk about life away from the drum kit. Mm. Um, you've, you travelled extensively doing music workshops. Tell us about some of the work you did there. Okay, I, I've so for a lot of years I've done what's called community music, and for instance, you I, you go to Rockhampton, and um, you you are to present a show on a riverbank in Rockhampton. So all drummers, that that that, that may be your brief. The city council has had submitted to someone and got this funding for you to do that. So you go up and you meet all the drummers. I mean, all the drummers, including indigenous didgeridoo players who I would classify as a rhythm instrument, or the Chinese drummers and the rock drummers and, you know, all the different, the marimba players and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And you put something together to go on a riverbank. Or I lived in Mount Isa for eight weeks and had to write I didn't have to write. I had to get the um, the people of Mount Isa to write a show about Mount Isa. And that's where I first met Delma and William Barton. And w William Barton is a, was just a baby then. And he, William Barton's an incredible Indigenous didgeridoo player. He's worked with, um, you know, Peter Sculthorpe now, and he goes over to London and... Anyways, that, that's another story, but I, play, I did the same thing in the Dandenong Rangers at the Dandenong Rangers Music Council with a woman called Bev McAllister who runs the most extraordinary community music programs up there. I did workshops again with drums, put on a drum show there. Um, I've worked uh, in a place called Eastbourne. Um, oh no, not Eastbourne, Beachport. Beachport, yeah. Eastbourne is where I um, made an album in England. Uh, Beachport, um, in uh, South Australia, um, preparing all these drummers for a festival parade. So that's the sort of, <laughs> the sort of thing I do. With, with all the school kids, actually, from that whole region, it was fantastic. That wow. was fantastic, yeah. How, how is that, what, what the experience did you Did you find it was uh, sharpening your, your own skills as well? The well, it, uh, it certainly um, makes you think about written pieces and, you know, how pieces are written and how drums are put together. I don't know whether it... I mean, it sharpens my skills as, uh, in terms of, of, of scoring stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I can score well. And a lot depends, though, on the... Um, a lot depends on the skills of the participants. So, you know, if you've got a whole but hundreds of school kids, you've got to keep it very simple. But I think keeping stuff simple and having it sound good is a skill in itself. Um, and, uh, well, it certainly um, has improved my skills as a director. You know, I've learned to direct. I've got lots of games, rhythm games. I've got lots of ways to keep people involved and, you know, just to teach them how to put rhythms together. Um, and clapping games, all sorts of stuff like that. I've collected a whole heap of that stuff. Yeah. Another project I'm sure you're very proud of is the Junction House Band. band? Yeah. yeah, I am. Yeah, I am. I, um, Junction House Band, uh, a, a group of intellectually disabled musicians. I've worked with them since 1993. We've d done two albums. We've done two musicals. Um, I do workshops with them on Thursday nights from 5 to 7. They write all their own material um, and um, it's a full rock band and uh, we do shows at community events. Yes, yeah, so you can imagine I'm very attached to that group yeah. and, and uh, that 13 years is a hell of a long time. You've been uh, actively involved in uh, some music industry related organisations, very active in looking after the rights of performers. Let, let's start with your work with the Photographic Performance Company. Uh, okay. how, what's the role of that organisation and what prompted your involvement? Okay, the Photographic Performance Company of Australia is a collection society. A collection society um, administers the rights of copyright holders. They collect licence fees for the of copyright mm -hmm. and they um, then distribute that um, income to the copyright holder. So, 
APRA is a collection society. Yep. Can you hear that beeping? Uh, no, you're cutting out a little bit, just just okay. for a second or so, but there's no beeping. Okay, I'm getting a beep. And I'm going to start that all again. Okay. Because the, uh, I had a beep, and I'm just cleaning the phone. All right. Um, PBCA is a collection society. It's like APRA. It collects the fees uh, for the use of the sound recording, whereas APRA collects the fees for the use of the musical work. The sound recording is the master. So in any CD, there's two copyrights. There's the copyright in the song and the copyright in the sound recording. Mm -hmm. So when PBCA collects um, those fees from radio stations who play sound recordings, they pay 50% to the recording artist and 50% to the record company who owns, owns it. Yep. Uh, so, in 1993, um, PPCA started distributions to recording artists for the first time. They didn't used to include us. Um, at that time, it was a small amount. Now it's 50-50. I got on the board. It's an elected position in 1993, and I've been re-elected to represent artists. Uh, the reason I'm into it is because... The way copyright works is that the songwriter ends up receiving most of the income. To me, this is a tragedy. That's why musicians who are non-composers tend, when they get to their 50s, to have absolutely no income. Mm -hmm. They've never received enough money to put it away. They don't receive money from um, the same sorts of monies that songwriters receive from the uses of the song. Yep. Uh, so PBCA is one way, it's a minuscule way of trying to redress that balance, even if it's min minuscule because PBCA collects nothing like the amounts of money that APA collect. Even if it's mi minuscule, my idea is for people to become aware of the fact that non-composers don't receive that sort of income and recording artists don't receive the sort of income that songwriters and try to address um, this imbalance in as many ways as are possible. Yeah, it does seem unfair because they do contribute so much to the finished product. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, you're also the National Coordinator for a wonderful organisation, Support Act, which we only wish had been around a lot longer than it has. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. What are some of the, the achievements of that organisation you're most proud of? Well, they're, they're little achievements, and, and that is every time you help somebody who's in need, you know, buying them a washing machine, buying them a bed, um, uh, you know, paying someone's utility bills for the year, um, you know, uh, paying the maintenance on a scooter, you know, that uh, is required to get a disabled person around. Uh, whenever we do any of those, whenever we pay for those things, that's, that's the job. Mm -hmm. And my, uh, I'm the only one employed on a part-time basis, and my job is to guide the applicants through the, the, the system because the, the application process isn't actually easy and I've got to write a report that goes to the committee that decides and um, Support Act only pays people's bills so people um, send in their bills and I, I feel it's my job to advocate on behalf of people who are applying mm. and uh, if they're eligible to make sure that they're looked after and, and that's what I do and yes it's you know, everyone who applies to us has spent substantial amounts of time in the industry and have got to the the age of 55, got ill, they're on a disability pension and have just nothing, yeah. nothing, and no income coming in apart from that. And it's very difficult living on the disabled pe pension when you're renting and if you you lose your teeth or, you know, any extra things that you need, clothes, shoes, um, you know, it becomes very difficult. And the support is ongoing. It's not just like a one-off benefit. Uh, it's it, um, it, it, um, beneficiaries are eligible for five years. Right. Three thousand dollars a year. It's not a lot, but it, it, it's a start. Really, the organisation's been going only for ten years, so you know it's it's got a long way to go. What about situations? I guess musicians are a proud bunch. You might hear of a situation of a musician in need, but they're perhaps too proud to, to come forward and seek seek help. How, how would you tackle a situation like that? That happens regularly. I, I'm always in a I have have this problem about attacking. Uh, sorry, about about contacting them myself because 
what worries me is if they're not eligible mm -hmm. and then you've, you've, you've contacted them and when they've done the application process, you find out that they're not eligible for some reason. Um, so I get, um, I'll, I'll contact someone who knows them. Right. And then I'll say, can you um, contact them, tell them about Support Act Limited, can you act as the intermediary at this stage and, uh, and I'll do it that way. Um, and some people are too shy to, um, and, don't, and, and don't want to, um, they're worried about confidentiality, which is not an issue because I'm the only one who knows who a person is, their name comes off. But sometimes it's really obvious because you put your CV, you've got to put, you know, what you've done on the application form. It's going to be really obvious sometimes yeah. who a person is. Um, but, um, uh, some people just, don't want to apply and I understand that and and so to also to ring them up and say you know hi it's Lindy and I'm from Support Act and this is what we do I, I find it hard to do that yeah, and I don't yeah, do it yeah you even uh, had a bit of a dabble in politics a few years ago how do you look back on that now uh, it was fantastic. Yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, there was no way I was going to be elected. I was um, stood for the Democrats in um, the state seat of Coogee and for Wentworth standing against Malcolm Turnbull, which was really fun um, <laughs> because he was a very bright man. And he was. that was also when Peter King was, was standing as the independent who was a liberal. So there was all that antagonism. He'd been the sitting member and, 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 and then uh, Malcolm won the pre-selection. So there was a lot of bitterness. And um, there was a lot, you know, I, I was actually had to, that was when Peter Garrett ran for the first time. Mm -hmm. So and he's in the next electorate. So we did a lot of, there were a lot of debates uh, with all the, 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 the um, candidates you know, across the two electorates. So sometimes I'd be on stages with Peter Garrett, which was a, a hoot. <laughs> and um, no, it was great, but it was exhausting because naturally I took it far too seriously. You know, if I was going to do it, I was going to do it properly. And the idea, you know, was all about getting Senator Aidan Ridgeway re-elected. And um, it was exhausting. And uh, honestly, I'm, I'm not kidding. I think that... Uh, I, I, I could never even consider doing it again. I was exhausted, but the, the, if I want to talk about what it did for me personally, what it did for me personally was I will never have trouble speaking publicly ever again. Oh, good. <laughs> it, it was like doing a training in how to debate for six weeks, you know, l learning how to debate, mm. you know, and, uh, and it, that was great, like fun, you know, it was really fun, but God, it was exhausting, <laughs> such hard work. Never again, hey? No, <laughs> never. I read another interview with you about that, done about that time where you said you've actively sought to seek a more normal life since the, since the go-betweens. Do you think you've achieved that? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I do think I've achieved that, although probably people who look at my lifestyle would go, w who's she getting? <laughs> but people didn't know me before. Yeah. Uh, but, no, I think I've... Uh, I, you know, uh, there's something kind of quirky about my personality that means no matter how straight I'm trying to be, people still think I'm weird, but... And I, I don't know what that is, but, mm. um, you know, I try to be as normal as possible but I often speak without thinking and uh, and I guess that's my my only flaw yeah so, so, so how much would the Lindy Morrison of today and the Lindy Morrison of 25 years ago have in common would they if they were able to sit down together would they get along hmm um I I I, I think I'd think that that she was like uh, um a bit of a nutter really <laughs> <laughs> i guess yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was you know loud obnoxious hyperactive you know like um really 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 lived in the moment yeah. i mean that was my big thing to live in the moment you know it was like you know, I was really influenced by Henry Miller, this mm. writer. Not, I don't know, young people won't know who Henry Miller are. They should bloody read him, though. And, uh, you know, that whole uh, kind of, um, you know, this is what, what uh, of course, Robert Forster railed against. You know, the fact I was into all that, that kind of artistic live in the now and all that stuff. 
So yeah, I, I you know, I, I just, um, you know, drums, I made drums a priority. That's all I was going to do and uh, nothing was going to stop me and, you know, that was it. Mm. Mm. So um, how often do you uh, drag the drum kit out these days? Well, I, you know, I, I work in rooms with drum kits, you know, every mm. second day. Oh, yeah, uh, of course. But how often do I drag them out? You know, I, I've been rehearsing with a band with Amanda for seven years. Seven years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to drag the, the drum kit out because we go to, across to Newtown. There's a, a house that we rehearse in. It's called The Rainy Season. It's had a lot of names. We, we only just... We keep telling it. We've done three gigs. We're recording slowly. We mm. don't take it very seriously. We're all too old. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> actually, there's a, a guy in it from uh, who used to. He comes from Melbourne in the old days. A band called the Cosmic Psychos. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah Peter Jones, his name is. Uh, he's he's in it too. But and Clyde Bramley, who was in um, uh, the early Hoodoo Gurus. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's two other people in it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and actually, you know, we 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 seven years is a long time. But uh, Amanda calls it our book club. <laughs> and she's, she's probably hit the nail on the head with that one. Yeah, it's a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> Lindy, thanks so much for your time. It's been an absolute treat to speak with you. Yeah, John, thank you very much because it's been a real, really good uh, interview. I enjoyed it immensely. Yeah. Thanks for uh, your major contribution to one of our most loved bands, and congratulations on all the fantastic work you've been doing. Thank you. Keep it up. Yep. All the best. Bye, Dom. Bye. Ta-da.